Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. If you ever wish that you could slip a petaflop under your arm and walk it down to the garage, well then today is your lucky day. What I've got on the bench today is Dell's take on NVIDIA's GB10, Blackwell's Studio Apartment Super Chip, and before we're done, we'll make it do three very real jobs that you can point to and say, well, hey, it actually does something useful. Still, it's not for everyone, and we'll figure out pretty quickly whether it's for you or not. Of course, we'll run the largest Olama model that will fit in the installed 128 gigabytes. Then we'll teach an agent to play Tempest from scratch until it stops embarrassing us. And then we'll wire up driveway video so that the system can tell when a new car shows up, and only when a new car shows up, without shipping pictures of your driveway off to anybody's cloud. If you've been waiting for a reason to care about CUDA that isn't pie in the sky or data center only, then this is your episode. The box itself is a study in scale done right. At the silicon heart is the GB10, a Grace Blackwell super chip that fuses a Blackwell class GPU to a Grace class ARM CPU over NVLink C to C with a single pool of unified coherent memory. You don't bolt a GPU into a PC and hope that the drivers behave. The GPU and the CPU are co-parents of 128 gigabytes of LPDDR5 class memory and both see the same tensors without a shuttle bus in the middle. On paper, NVIDIA raced it at about a petaflop of FP4 AI math, which is the new low-precision darling of the transformer engine era. In practice, what you feel is that you can keep serious models resident and do real work at the edge without worrying about which side of the PCIe bus your state lives on. I'll keep the spec tour short because we've walked through it once before, but a few details do matter. The Grace CPU here is a 20-core ARM design, 10 of the Cortex-X925 big cores paired with 10 A725 efficiency cores and the GPU block lands with 6,144 CUDA cores, modern RT tensor cores, and clocks the top out around 2.4 GHz in the Spark Dev unit that's closest to what Dell is also building around. Memory bandwidth for the LPDDR5 pool sits in the mid-200 GB range. Think about 275 GB a second with a 256-bit interface. The SSD slot is a slim 2242M2 up to 4 TB, and you can get at it by popping off the bottom cover. You also get dual QSFP for 2x100GB ConnectX7 class networking, plus a 10 gigabit port on Realtek Silicon, all in a chassis that sips, well, sips about 230 watts through a pretty hefty external brick. Now, that's not rumor or conjecture, that's what the current DGX Spark developer unit ships with, and Dell's GB10 box aims squarely at the same profile, right down to the same Ubuntu-based DGX OS Linux software image and the lab-in-a-box setup experience. The point of all that coherence in I.O. isn't just bragging rights, it's friction removal. The unified memory pool means that you spend your time thinking about the model in the pipeline instead of inventing yet another ring buffer because your host and your device can't agree on a pointer's custody schedule. And that's why, even with the caveat that a 4090-class desktop can smoke it on some raw FP8 benchmarks, developers who've lived on discrete VRAM suddenly find themselves finishing more ambitious experiments locally. Because they're not bouncing between RAM and VRAM, they're just getting stuff done. So let me ground this in our first job, biggish models on Olama. You can, of course, run 7 billion and 13 billion parameter toys on practically anything these days. The difference with the GB10 is that 128 gigabytes of unified memory plus Blackwell's FP4 path lets you keep models in the I can actually use this for coding tier resonant in memory, and do so with the modern stack that will follow you later to bigger irons. There's a great canonical example from NVIDIA's launch demo. GPT OSS at the 120 billion parameter level as a supervisor in a multi-agent setup, flanked by a code model and a vision language model all resident all at once. You're not swapping models in and out of memory to answer a single question, because the whole orchestra is tuned in on stage at the same time. And that's kind of the mental model to bring to a llama on the GB10. In practice, the easy way to get there looks like this. You just install a llama in the usual fashion but you can pile it with CUDA and link it against Tensor RT LLM so you can take advantage of Blackwell's transformer engine in FP4. NVIDIA's docs for the Spark units show NVFP4 quantization flows that keep accuracy within about a percentage point of FP8 on many popular checkpoints thanks to two-level scaling and per-micro tensor calibration. And it sounds like marketing, but it's not just marketing. It's the math that makes this class of box actually feel fast despite comparatively slow LPDDR class bandwidth. The punchline is that an about 110 gigabyte memory budget isn't a straitjacket. It's a target you can hit with a 120 billion class quant and a modest context window, with headroom for the embedding model and a retriever without falling off a cliff. 
If you've seen folks compare the Spark to dual 4090 regs and conclude that the 4090s will win, yes, of course, they're not wrong, but the, they're often answering the wrong question. The 4090s are sprinters with 48 gigabytes of total VRAM between them, and they're brilliant in a single tight loop. But the GB10 is more of a decathlete. It's slower on one event, but it can run three events at once because it can actually accommodate them in memory at the same time. That's the superpower that Unified Memory buys you for multimodal and multi-agent setups. And it's exactly why the Ulama plus Reg plus Tools story feels different this time around. The rest of the story is the ecosystem. Setup is less Linux sysadmin cosplay and more join the hotspot, jump into the DGX dashboard, connect VS Code, and get to work. Yes, you can SSH in like a growing up as I do, but the point is that you don't have to. Our second job is going to be a little more fun. Reinforcement learning on Tempest. If you've never watched an agent go from flailing to frightening, Tempest is a perfect example. It's got a clean action space, a deliciously hostile reward surface, and it was born back when color vectors were brand new. The trick with RL on edge gear like the GB10 is to keep your throughput high enough that learning feels like play, not penance, and to do it in a way that exercises CUDA beyond the call and pray. So here's how I wired it. The game itself runs in a series of MAME emulator instances on a Threadripper, and those frames are sent to the CUDA-based Python app on a second Threadripper, which just happens to be equipped with dual RTX 6000 cards for maximum impact. Every frame that is generated by every game instance is analyzed, important game metrics are extracted, and they are sent over a network socket to the GB10. The GB10 receives that socket data, decodes the frame information, and stores it in a replay buffer. Then, several hundred times per second, the GB10's GPU randomly selects from many thousands of frames in the replay buffer and then trains on them. As it does so, it learns what frame states and control movements lead to high reward situations versus, let's say, death of the player in the game. And over time, it makes better and better decisions. It's a lot harder than I expected, but it works well enough that it can play better than most human players, but nowhere near the level that I can play the game on, so it's still got a long way to go. When it came time to test the setup on the GB10, the only thing I had to do was to install NumPy and Torch with Python, which gave me complete access to the CUDA functionality that I needed. With that, I could run everything on the GB10. It has the actual CPU horsepower to run the server and train the AI on the same box, and so the little GB10 completely replaced two huge towers with Threadrippers containing top-of-the-line GPUs. And was it as fast? No. But it was fast enough, and that's the point. I've got a complete reinforcement learning system running on a little box that you can hold in the palm of your hand. Job three is one my neighbors actually notice. Text me if an unfamiliar car pulls into the driveway. I want to ship my family video or video from my driveway off to some cloud service, and so while I rely on Unify for on-prem detections, I've been curious to see if I could whip something up on my own in Python. The GB10's role here is twofold. It ingests and understands. Video comes in via the RTSP protocol. Frames are decoded on the GPU with deep stream class pipeline, so you're not burning CPU to throw bits away. A lightweight detection model, I'm using uh, one called YOLO here, is able to keep up with the camera's native rate, producing bounding boxes and embeddings for the vehicles. The embeddings go into a little vector index on an NVMe along with a hash of plate-like regions. The index is primed with your household's cars. The trigger isn't a car exists, it's a car whose embedding is out of distribution with respect to the existing gallery, which is a fancy way of saying new. We throttle notifications by requiring persistence across N frames, and I include a link to the local dashboard for review. The entire loop, decode, detect, embed, decide, never leaves the box, and because it's CUDA from end to end, your eventual migration to a multi-camera warehouse system is more streams, more NIC, rather than change horses. If you want a head start, NVIDIA Spark playbooks include video search and summarization pipelines that already run on this footprint. Swapping their spec for yours is mostly plumbing. And none of this would matter if the software stack didn't feel frictionless. You treat them like a desktop. You can plug in a mouse, keyboard, HDMI, and go. Or you can drop them headless on the LAN as an AI brain that your laptop leans on. There's a DGX dashboard front end where Jupyter and friends are a click away, and the Git repos behind it are shockingly complete. And now a word about the numbers that everybody craves and then misunderstands. Raw inference throughput at FP8 or BF16 on the GB10 is not going to beat a big gaming card strapped to a modern PC. What the GB10 does do is to make FP4 feel like first-class precision with hardware to back it up and software that treats it as a normal mode rather than just a curiosity. The quantization flows, you know, NVIDIA's own and the community ones like Unsloth, are aimed squarely at taking bigger checkpoints down to FP4 with minimal perplexity drift. 
When you stack FP4 with speculative decoding, you get the feeling of snappy chat and coding even at large model sizes. And you do it with memory footprints that invite multimodal workflows. It's a different axis of fast, and for the kinds of edge jobs we're doing here, it's the axis that matters. Now let's talk about scale out because those QSFP cages on the back aren't just pretty decoration. The Connectec 7 NIC inside the Spark unit happily does 100 gigabits per port in reasonable thermal conditions, and when you wire two GB10 boxes together, you can run NCCL across them like a baby cluster. You don't get an NVLink domain, you get a network fabric that's good enough for tensor parallel inference on wider decoders or mixture of experts routing, and it's a superb way to learn how to multi-host GPU programming without building a cool dial in your basement. It's also a neat trick for the Olama crowd. Attach a second node, pin the embedding and retriever on the sidecar, and keep the big decoder's memory pressure flat as you add tools. The Spark reference numbers show full duplex throughput in the 130 to 150 gigabits a second range on a warm system, and about half that when the rest of the box is totally saturated. Translation, this is not the two Thunderbolt cables in a dream recipe. It's real, and it's made for real fabrics. Cost and power? Well, the developer unit I've got here slots in between nice GPU and very nice workstation. Think 3 to 4K, depending on how you spec the SSD and so on. Power budgets hover around 230 watts at the wall when it's really busy. That's not pocket change, but it's also not a 1.1 kilowatt monster that your breaker panel is going to resent. In the uh, left it on for a year math, you're in for the few hundred dollars class rather than four figure regrets, so you can do all your learning without meter anxiety. Now, Dell's value add here isn't just shaving a watt, it's making this a standard SKU with service, spares, and a predictable image that you can deploy and manage like any other fleet device when your proof of concept turns into 100,000 boxes on shelves. If you're a Windows first developer and the word ARM gives you pause, take a breath. You're not cross-compiling kernel drivers, you're writing CUDA and Python and C++ against the same user mode stacks that you'll deploy elsewhere. My own code just worked and it was seamless to me that it was ARM underneath in that regard entirely. The DGX OS is Ubuntu based on this platform and the toolchain is the toolchain. CUDA, TensorRT, Triton, PyTorch Nightly if you like living dangerously with Python 3.1.4, or VLLM if you like serving tokens for a living. And remote development via VS Code feels exactly like punching into any other Linux server in Iraq. I spent the last couple of weeks working in a VS Code SSH remote, and it's seamless. The only thing that changes when you graduate to a bigger Blackwell is how much power you can spend and how many GPUs your NCCL ring sees. Now that straight line portability from this little box to huge racks of equipment is the deepest reason to start doing GPU programming properly on a GB10 today. Everything you build and learn here carries forward. Now, because I can already hear the comments forming, yes, you can image Gen on it, and yes, it's fun to use comfy UI to roast a coffee mug while the fans keep your actual coffee warm. But if your only workload is generating risque anime all night long, you don't need coherent memory or dual QSFP to begin with. This platform truly sings when you ask it to be many things at once. An LLM that knows your code base, a retriever that understands your drawings and PDFs, a tiny video analytics cluster, and a training loop scribbling on a Tempest agent, and maybe a web backend that glues them all together. The last piece I want to leave you with is the operator mindset that this enables. The edge isn't a synonym for underpowered, although it starts to feel like it sometimes. Edges where latency, privacy, and physics make round tripping dumb. A desk-friendly GB10 gives you a modern CUDA lab that's also durable service, with a networking stack that lets two of them play cluster without pretending your home office is an actual availability zone. Once you internalize that, the build versus buy axis kind of tilts. You can stop asking, can I do this locally, and you start asking, why would I do it anywhere else? You only go cloud when you really need to. If you're price sensitive, it's fair to ask whether a $2,000 or so AMD AI mini PC or a maxed out M series Mac with gobs of unified memory will get you close. The honest answer is that you can get impressive FP8 class inference on the former and a lovely dev experience on the latter. But neither gives you Blackwell's FP4 as a first class citizen, neither comes with dual 100 gigabit QSFP and NCCL in his bones, and neither is the on wrap to the exact same CUDA stack that you use on a B200 a year from now. That alignment of tools, kernels, and fabrics is what you're really buying here. So where does that leave us? With a little black box that can keep 120 billion parameter assistant resident while it processes your PDFs, runs a Tempest agent until it masters the spinner, and washes your driveway without writing you out to the cloud. With a CUDA stack that starts at your desk and ends in a data center without making you change horses midstream. Everything you learn with a GB10 applies one-to-one -one when it's time to scale up, and if the day ever comes when you need bigger than a petaflop, you'll already be thinking in the right shape.
Remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so I'd be honored if you consider leaving one of each before you go today. And if you're already subscribed, thank you. Take a second to check that you haven't been accidentally unsubscribed along the way. It seems to happen. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.